Good morning, Vintage Church. It's so wonderful to have you join us online here for our worship. Let's pray as we begin to worship. Father, we thank you that you are with us wherever we are. Your presence surrounds us. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you now to fill us, to lead us into worship, to sit at the feet of Jesus and to give him all the glory. So Father, we thank you that we can worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we stand, whether you're at home, whether you're by yourself with friends or elsewhere, why don't we stand and let's worship together.
He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before Him.
So, Father, we declare at this time that our hope is in you, that you are our firm foundation. We thank you that on you is solid ground, that your love is a firm foundation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you grab a seat? We're going to continue in prayer as together the church comes and comes before our Lord Jesus Christ in prayer to see his kingdom come. So Grace is going to lead us in prayer. So whether you're at home or by yourself with others, why don't you all just either sit or kneel and assume a posture of prayer as we come before our God together. Would you join me in prayer? Dear God, we thank you for this day as we unite in worship with our brothers and sisters who are joining us online. Thank you that we are not a place or a building, but a people, the people of God. Jesus, you preached on mountaintops, plains, synagogues, and homes. Thank you that through technology, your message can reach beyond what we can imagine. Thank you that we worship in word and spirit, and we don't have to be physically here to feel it. Lord, we pray for the devastating impact that coronavirus has made in the last two weeks. In the midst of the hardship, thank you that your spirit cannot be quarantined. Your power, your majesty, and your glory cannot be restrained or contained. Help us not to put you in the same box that we feel so tied to. In this global crisis, teach us that Jesus Christ is all that we need. As we stand in line at Costco, let us count the cost, though, of what our panic brings. Anxiety, distress, and unbelief, things that are not of you. Teach us to embrace the fullness of you. Through this, God, remind us that we are your church in every season. And for that reason, we are not confined by space or time. Whether in person or online, we are your body just like the limbs of a body extends north to south and east to west, so it is with the body of Christ far reaching to every corner of our city, our country, and our world, united in one accord. Surrounded by a fortress of empty shelves and empty stores, we wonder what is in store for us. Lord, we wonder, will we have enough to eat? Will we get sick? How will I make a living? God, we ask that you give us today our daily bread. Lord, we talk so much about clean hands, but what about pure hearts? We are so fixated on getting rid of germs that we neglect the seeds of despair that germinate in our souls, sanitize the thoughts of anxiety that leave residue and poison our minds. When we're stuck in paralysis, we often offer our own analysis of why and how and what should be done. We act as the expertise when you, Holy Spirit, our paraclete, are moving in our midst. You give us a peace that surpasses understanding. So who are we to be standing in the way? We pray for our leaders who lead our city, state, country, and world. Give them wisdom and strength to lead us well. We pray for all the medical professionals Grant them discernment and strength as they care for us. We pray for those who are sick. Give them healing and comfort. We pray for those who have passed and who have lost a loved one. Grant them peace as they grieve. Teach us to rest. Interrupt our constant thoughts of worry. Refresh our weary bodies. Still our trembling hearts. Calm our nervous spirits. Quiet our frenzied minds and bring peace to our restless souls. Lord, forgive us for focusing on the lack, the omission, instead of what if this is an invitation to your great commission to make disciples of all nations, reaching them globally through an online transmission as we serve our city and our neighbors living a life of mission. Activate your church, O oh Lord, to be your hands and feet, to be the hope of the world in this critical time and beyond. In your mighty and precious name we pray, amen.
Well, again, good morning. It's so great to have you join us online at Vintage Church LA. If you don't know who I am, my name is Gare. I'm one of the pastors here. And it's a really great delight to have you join us. Thank you so much. I want to give you some updates as we obviously head into uncharted territory here at Vintage Church. And with love and without fear, we want to serve our city well over these next few weeks. And so just to give you a few updates... And first of all, just about today's service, if you're new to Vintage, our services last about 75 minutes. I'm going to be speaking in a minute, and then we'll have a time of worship before we close. And of course, we are responding in line with the guidelines of our governor and the state of how we can love one another and serve each other right now in this season. And so we will continue for next week, and then we will take advice from our state governor on whether we continue live streaming, but please do pass the word around that we will be online, and it would be so great to have you join us and maybe invite friends as well. We continue with our small gatherings. Please do check out our website and see what small gatherings, community groups, and social groups are happening right now, and we'll be updating that daily. And so please do look out for news about what is going on. We also have new online groups where you can connect online and also prayer and care resources that we have put in place a whole new system of prayer and care for those who are most vulnerable, for those who may be sick, and for those who would love to receive care at this time. So please do go online. Also subscribe to our Instagram feed, and you'll receive daily updates on how we as a church can be the church in this moment. So please do watch for that. I will be also sending out a weekly email on Mondays that shares with you what is going on in the life of the church this coming week. So as of today, um, there are a few things happening. We'd love you to join with us. So the mums group is happening tomorrow. Please do come to that. And also, importantly, on Tuesday night, we have our online prayer meeting every Tuesday. We will be holding a prayer meeting live streamed for the whole church to gather together and pray. And so please do join us there. Before we turn to God's word together, why don't we pray? So Father, we thank you so much that you are with us, that you go before us, and that in all things we know your presence, your guidance, and your love as the firm foundation in our lives. As we turn to your word now, we pray that you would speak to us, encourage us, guide us, that we may be your church, your salt and light in the city. In Jesus' name, amen. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says, For God has given us not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. With everything going on, it's hard, isn't it, to not have a spirit of fear. So often it's easy to be disoriented or disheartened or confused. And the question I hear often, the emails coming in of how are saying to me every day, how are we going to move forward? What do we do? And importantly, what is God calling us to do as his people and his church? Could it be more than stocking up on toilet roll and Purell? Could it be more that God has for us as the church of Jesus Christ in this moment? And I felt God say this. That in this pandemic, we are not pausing church, we are not postponing church, but we are activating church in new ways to be the salt and light of Jesus Christ in this city. We are not pausing, but we are activating. This is the time for the church to bring hope and love into our city. I'm reminded of a picture that good friend of ours, and now a New York Times best-selling author, sketched that reminded me of what it looks like today to be the church of Jesus Christ. I'm not too sure we have a picture of that. But it's so easy, isn't it, for us to think that the church is the building, that the church is a service. But we are the people of God. The church is the Holy Spirit people of God. We don't rely on buildings, we don't rely on certain uh, worship services, but in this moment we are pressing ever deeper into the truth that the people of God is the church of God, that we are the temple of God, filled with his Holy Spirit, on mission in the world to bring his love and grace to those who are in need. 
A few months ago, I read an article about the impact that the church can have when it's captivated, that the church is the hope of the world. It said this, in the early centuries, Christians found themselves persecuted and tortured for their strange beliefs. But at the same time, contrary to culture, non-Christian historians commented that it was the Christians who welcomed slaves. It was the Christians who treated women as equals. It was the Christians who demanded husbands treat their wives with respect and fidelity. It was the Christians who used church funds to buy the emancipation of slaves. And when Roman fathers would leave unwanted children in fields to die, it was the Christians who would adopt the children and defy the social structure by caring for them. It was the Christians who even showed love and grace and affection towards those with different beliefs and even their own torturers. And when plagues hit the city of Rome and everyone fled the city to escape those infected, it was the Christians who invaded the city and cared for the poor, the sick, and dying at great risk to their own lives. It's in moments like this that the church reveals its true colors, not as people who self-preserve, but who people who self-sacrifice. So I want to ask the question this morning, how can we be an activated church for this moment? How can we, in a time of fear, bring peace? In a time of sickness, bring care and healing? In a time of isolation, bring connection? In a time of hoarding, to bring sharing? In a time of self-preservation, to bring self-sacrifice? I'm going to look at a passage in the New Testament, Acts chapter 4, where the early church suffered, in many ways, something like what we're going through today. It wasn't a virus, but it was the persecution of the Roman Empire. And they were disoriented. Peter and John, in this passage we're about to read, had been arrested, had been freed on the condition that they would not tell others about Jesus. They were asking the same questions we are asking. Do we pause church? Do we postpone? Do we hibernate? What do we do? But in that moment, they decided not to pause, but to activate. I'm going to look at the four things they did to be activated, to bring the good news of Jesus Christ in that moment in that time. So if you have your Bibles, please open your Bible to Acts chapter 4. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll put it on the screen for you now as I read. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God, O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The first thing we see is that an activated church gathers. An activated church gathers. In verse 23, we read, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. Peter Peter and John knew that in times of disorientation, we need each other. We need each other more than ever. They knew that they needed encouragement. They knew that they needed each other to speak truth and not fear to one another. They knew that they needed each other to care for them. They didn't want to be isolated. They knew that they needed the community around them. In fact, in this time, in this moment, the church gathered together so much that it says in verse 32, all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. These moments bring the best out of the church. 
where we unite, where we share what we have, where we realize that what we have is not our own, but it's to be together to stand with one another. I don't know about you, but I am not the first to admit that I need others. I grew up in a culture where it was strong to have it all together, where it was weak to admit that you need help. And for years, even as a, as a teenager and in my early 20s, I would try and be the person who wouldn't need other people. I would be the rock for others, but never reach out. And I remember once my pastor at the time, a man called David Jones, looked at me and in his loving rebuke said to me, Gare, yeah, do you know that by yourself, you are horrendous? He said, by yourself, you really are hopeless. Do you know by yourself, you're terrible. I was taken aback. I thought, how dare you say that? I've got it all together. He said, Gare, yeah, don't you realize that you are just a piece of the body of Christ? You need others. You are weak where others are strong. And the beautiful thing, he says, Gare, yeah, once you open yourself up to others, we are all stronger together. It's a time in these moments not to stand off and isolate. It's a time to come together. When you're in need to reach out to someone, when you're fearful to ask someone to pray, when you're strong to reach out to encourage, when you're well-resourced to reach out to those who are in need. We need to care for one another, to care for those who are sick, to come alongside those who are lonely and isolated, to encourage those who are afraid, to support our families with children out of school, to provide for those who are facing economic uncertainty, to share with those who run out of toilet paper. Whatever it may be, we are to be there for one another. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is not the time of isolation, but it's the time of intentional community, but in new ways. Praise God for technology. That is such a time as this that we have technology to find new ways of congregating, to be the community of Christ. I want to tell you what we're doing here at Vintage in this next season of ways that we can still gather, that we can encourage and love one another. We are continuing throughout the week to meet in small groups. Check out our website for those community and social groups that are happening. And also on Sunday, we are inviting people to gather in small groups to watch church together, to be church in the home on Sunday mornings. These in-person gatherings are always subject to the advice of our authorities, our government, and our healthcare leaders. But secondly, we are moving community online. We are launching live stream community groups, online chat groups, where you can join in with others and encourage and pray and share your needs. And we are hosting right now live stream courses. We are moving all of our courses onto an online live stream format. So today, John Thomas kicked off our foundations course online with many people signed up to grow in the basics of Jesus Christ as they enter into a journey with him. We are also putting on pastoral care resources that you can feel cared for. I want to say that we are launching a new team called the Crisis Care Team, asking people to join that, go online to join that Crisis Care Team where we can actually practically help those who are in self-isolation and that we can do errands for them, we can care for them, and we can love them where they can't help themselves right now for those reasons. So please do join us together as we dig deep into being the community of God and gathering and being there for another. The second thing we see in the early church is that an activated church not only gathers, but also prays. An activated church prays. I don't know about you, but it's interesting that their main strategy when they came together was not to panic, was not to put a plan in place, was not to start stockpiling. The first thing they did, we see in verse 24, was this. When they heard the report, 
all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. They knew that, the, that prayer was the first and most important activity of the Christian in these times. Why pray? Why did they first turn to prayer? Well, they believed in the two fo- vital foundations of any praying life. Firstly, they believed that God could do something about it. That God could do something about it. Verse 24, they began their prayer with these words, O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. They knew that they were praying to a sovereign God. A God who is powerful to intervene. A God who doesn't cause suffering, but he can do something about it. They turned to prayer because they knew that God is above any trauma or trial. That God is greater than any concern or confusion. That he is more secure than any bear market or empty market. And he's more powerful than any crisis or coronavirus. This is how we deal with our fears. We turn to a sovereign God in prayer. We're reminded of the truth of his power, the truth of his sovereignty. We're reminded of the security of his love and his death and resurrection. We come to pray knowing that in him we are secure in our hope and our future and in our eternity. We come to him in prayer knowing that he is never absent, but he is always working. But secondly, they came to prayer because they not only believed God could do something about it, but they believed their prayers mattered. They believed their prayers mattered. In verse 29, I love the confidence of their prayer. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. They were not shy in asking God to give them boldness. See, they were confident in their prayer because they knew they had a sovereign father who listened to their prayers. Not only listened to their prayers, but responded to them. God works with and through the prayers of his people. We have a role to play, and that is to pray, to see his kingdom come and his will being done. See, they knew the privilege and the responsibility to pray. It was Blaise Pascal who said, God instituted prayer in order to lend his creatures the dignity of causality. In other words, things will not happen unless we pray about it. There are things that will only happen when we pray about it. It's Gary Haugen of IJM who said, God has always used secondary means, human means, to accomplish his sovereign purposes. God's primary means is moving his people to pray and then answering their prayers. It's in these moments when God calls his church to pray, to pray for the sick, to pray for the slowing of the spread of this virus, to pray for a vaccine, to pray for our healthcare workers, to pray for our hospitals that they may not be overwhelmed, to pray for those who are in fear, to pray for those who are sacrificing that they might continue with boldness and courage. So we at Vintage are calling our church to prayer. We're activating our church to prayer. Personally, to daily prayer. We're putting online worship playlists that you can worship and pray in the presence of God. We want to encourage you all, if you're not doing already, to follow a Bible reading plan that you can pray through that Bible reading plan. One I heartily recommend is the Bible in one year with Nikki Gumbel. It's a great and popular app on your phone or on the internet you can listen to or read that together we can be in the presence of God, lifting up our voices in prayer. We're inviting all groups when they get together, virtually or together, to begin with prayer, that we are a praying people. And of course, every Tuesday, we'll be live streaming our prayer meeting to have you join us. And when our next Kingdom Come comes, we'll be live streaming Kingdom Come. An activated church is a praying church. An activating church, thirdly, is a church on mission. Have you noticed what they prayed for? And I know when I read this, it's not what I would have prayed for. 
I would have prayed for safety. I would have prayed that the authorities wouldn't find me as I hid. I would have prayed for more toilet paper and Purell. But this is not what they prayed for. All of these things could be important, but they had a higher priority. And in verse 29, it says this, They prayed, Give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May many miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They didn't pray what I would have prayed. They didn't pray for their personal kingdom to be safe and secure, but God's kingdom to come in power and love. They didn't pray inwardly, but outwardly. They didn't pray for self-preservation, but self-sacrifice. They didn't pray for security in their homes, but to be sent out in mission. Sometimes we forget that God uses all circumstances to send out his people to bring the hope and love and salvation of Jesus Christ. I was reminded of this and taught this when I was at law school. Life was going well. Everything was according to the plan and in the control that I had in my hands. I thought everything was going to be great. I went to law school, but something hit me from the side, something unexpected, something that demolished my expectations and my control. And that is I developed in the first year of law school a deep speech impediment, a stammer. I thought, hang on a minute, how am I going to be a lawyer and have a speech impediment. I can't even get out my name. How on earth am I going to stand in front of a judge? I was devastated. Fear took over my life. I was devastated of what my future would now hold. And I went home to visit my parents for the weekend, walked into the door, and I burst into tears. I thought my life and my future was now uncertain and out of control. My parents were wonderful and they prayed with me and prayed that the stammer would go. They prayed that I would not fear. They prayed that God's presence would be around me. And this was all very comforting because this is what I wanted them to pray for. But my father at the end said, I just want to also pray for something else. And he said, I pray. And I heard his prayer and I wasn't very happy. I heard his prayer. He said, in this moment, God, I pray that Gare would take the good news of love and salvation to the stammering community. I pray that even though he has this stammer, that you might give him more opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I pray that this community that is so often in fear and isolated, that you are sending Gare into this community to be the face and love of Jesus Christ. And I was listening to this. I thought, that all sounds very good, but I don't really like that prayer. And yet, a seed dropped in my heart that in all things, God is with us. In all things, God is sending us. And in these moments, there are new opportunities to be sent by the Holy Spirit to bring the love and mercy of God to those around us. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 5. He says, you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Church, this is our time where we don't retreat, but we go out. We don't hibernate, but we activate in mission to bring the love and hope of Jesus Christ to a city wondering where is our hope, where is our future. It's in these moments of uncertainty that the church of Christ can preach the certainty of Jesus. I often say to my friends that when we run Alpha, Alpha for me is church at its best because we come together on a Tuesday night to be the church for people to experience Jesus Christ. And it's the church at its best because we're focused on mission. And I believe at this time, as we focus on mission, the true colors of the church shine. This is church at its best. Sacrificing, serving, loving, going out at the risk of ourselves to love others. So what does it look like for Vintage? to be on mission in this 
moment. Well, firstly, I want to encourage us all to love our city by being part of the solution to slow the spread of this virus. That we want to slow the spread through the guidelines that we've been encouraged to do, washing our hands, social distancing in large groups, that we can actually prevent the spike and overwhelm our healthcare services. And while we do that, I want to encourage us all to love our neighbors. In practical ways, think through creatively what it means for us to be salt and light in our city. It could be that we provide meals for children who are no longer in school and families are suffering and struggling to feed their family. It could be children now who are off school for a few weeks that we offer babysitting or we offer to take them to the park or something to give mums a break. It could be that we check on our older generation around us, our neighbors, to see if we can help them and serve them in any way. It could be, and it will be, that we decide as a church community to share, not to hoard. Check out the updates of whether blood donations are needed that we can actually contribute in a city that is sometimes in these moments pulling back. Pray for and share hope with others. Look at your local economy, your restaurants and your cafes and see how, even talk to them and say, how can we support you at this time? And at Vintage, we're talking with our missions partners to see how we can serve them, how we can be there for them. And of course, giving financially to continue giving to the church and also to others that we can actually continue to serve our city and be the salt and light of Christ. Finally, an activated church is not just a church who gathers, not just a church who prays, not just a church who goes out on mission, but finally, an activated church is a church that is filled with the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 31, after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preach the word of God with boldness. We cannot do this in our own strength. We need the Spirit. Jesus modeled this, didn't he? When he went out into his ministry, it said that he was full of the Holy Spirit. Before he sent out his church, he said, wait to receive the Holy Spirit. And I want to end with this picture again that Charlie Mackesy drew. That the Holy Spirit does not dwell in a building, but he dwells in you and me. And this time, more than ever, we need to be full of his Spirit to calm our fears, to lift our worship, and to empower our mission. This is not a time to pause. It's not a time to postpone. It's a time to activate. Let's not lean out, but lean in. Let's not be in fear, but in faith. And let's bring the love and hope and salvation of Jesus Christ to our city. Let's pray together. I'd love you, wherever you are, to close your eyes and maybe as we invite the Holy Spirit to come and fill us again, to maybe stand, either open up your arms like this, or kneel, and adopt a posture of surrender and dependency on the Holy Spirit. And we're going to wait and just ask Him to come. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come. You are in us for those who confess Jesus Christ. But Lord, we need your fullness to calm our fears, to root us deeper into Jesus Christ, to focus our minds on the sovereignty of our loving Father and to empower us to go out in mission. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Pour out your Spirit. Your Word says in Romans 5 that, Father, you pour out your Holy Spirit 
into our hearts to fill us with your love. So we pray now that you would pour your love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would give creativity right now to people of how they can love and serve their neighbors at this time. How they can reach out to those who are isolated. How they can share with those who are in need. I pray you'd just now bring to mind maybe one or two people that we can reach out to check in on, to encourage, to care for. And Father, we offer our lives to you, not in fear but faith, to use us to bring your love, your hope, your light, your mercy to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to worship now for about 10 or 15 minutes or so. Use this time to let your heart recalibrate to the truth of the goodness of Jesus Christ. Enjoy his presence. I know it may feel awkward if you're at home, but stand. Close your eyes and worship. There's nothing more important than being at home in the presence of God. So let's worship together.
stone that is Christ and as we declare this Lord we find refuge in your love that is all around us that is surrounding us that is with us so may this song penetrate our hearts this morning that we are loved by God that we are seen by God we sing this together before I spoke a word Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Every moment you are good. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. 
break the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Jesus, we thank you that you are our living hope. You are the roaring lion. You are the victor over sin and death. You are our firm foundation in this life and forevermore. And so we give our wheat to you and we rest secure in your love and your hope. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. As before we go, let's remind ourselves of the victory of Jesus Christ over all that we face in our city, in our world. Let's declare this together, saying all of our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. And all of our hope we set on the risen Christ. And so may God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, remain with you. Join us online throughout the week that we can communicate and gather and love one another and be the church activated to love our city, to bring hope into the darkness, light into fear, and see Jesus' name be glorified. In his name we pray. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God bless you. We're here for you. We love you.